Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Sarah Jo Leitner. I am with Metal Recycles. Um, we are located in north central Washington, east of the Cascades National Park. Um, we are a conglomerate of a bunch of little townships, Twisp, Mazama, Winthrop, Carlton. Um, I like to see us as all the way down to Pateros and Metau and Brewster. We're just a very long valley snugged into the foothills of the North Cascades. Um, I will take a second to introduce myself in my background. Um, I came into this sector from kind of a, a side. Um, I worked as a, in the restaurant business as a professional chef for 23 years. Um, when I got out of the business, I worked as a consultant and I uh, took a job with a big food service firm that um, ran a LEED certified building. And so I got kind of plunged into this entire world of conservation and diversion and compostable materials working in Portland, Oregon and a LEED certified building that had five restaurants in it. Um, and my every single day got turned into what are we doing to ensure that we can stay compliant and how do we get the most diversion possible? Um, and after a couple of years of working with this giant food service firm, I in, found myself relocating to the beautiful Metau Valley, which was a huge change in life. I went from uh, Portland, Oregon, um, to the Metau Valley. And I first showed up on my first day of work and I said, where's the compost bucket? And I was quickly ushered into the ideology of um, rural life uh, in that the compost bucket was really the chicken scrap bucket or the pig bucket. Um, and that we didn't have a community compost program. Um, and then from there, I segued into the nonprofit realm, working in arts and culture. I am an artist as well. And I got really, really involved in an organization called the Art of Rule. Um, their entire platform when they were first starting out was how can creative professionals and artists who live in the rural space benefit their um, community beyond just the creation of artwork. And they really talked a lot about breaking down the rural urban divide um, and how do we move rural communities forward uh, in a way that feels supportive and innovative. And what it came down to is lots of rural communities need outside of the box thinkers. Um, so I spent a lot of time mentoring artists how to get involved in town government, in um, the school board, on boards of directors. And then the position at Metal Recycles came available and I jumped right in. So I made this huge transition out of arts and culture into solid waste sector. Um, and it has been such an exciting change. Every day I'm completely excited and engaged with the amount of innovation that's happening right now. Um, how much support this community has for each other to really move the needle forward. Um, we run to the problem to solve it, which I find to be so invigorating. Um, so I want to thank Zero Waste Washington and Cami and Zinnia and everybody on the planning committee for holding this space and um, letting a rural voice have a seat at the table to talk about kind of what we're doing. So I will share my screen. And let's see, there we go. Okay. So um, Metal Recycles is a 21 year old organization. Um, we run a material reclamation facility and for the first 15 years, that was our huge focus. Um, we are one of the only rural MRFs uh, in the country where we also do curbside commingle recycle processing. Um, we are extremely lucky and we have a very engaged community here that wants to be participatory. Um, and about five years ago, we really transitioned our organization to be a waste prevention organization that also recycles. And that started a whole bunch of new conversations within our community where we were not just talking about 
aluminum can recycling, but we're talking about preventing waste to begin with and other options in the rural space. Um, and so the first thing I'm gonna touch on is repair. Um, we started to pilot a repair program that has turned into a wildly successful program. And what I wanna talk about is um, moving beyond diversion because of course diversion is really important. Fixed rates are important, quantifying our impact. That's a constant to-do list. But what I've seen is it's a method for building community. So um, on this slide, I've got a couple of themes and touch points. Um, it creates a sense of belonging. It's a space for connection. Uh, it's a place where elders can fight isolation. Um, it goes to preserve the rural lifestyle. And it also creates options and ways for people of all social economic backgrounds to get involved. Um, in the Meta Valley, uh, last year, there was an economic study that was done, and there was a huge disparity that's happened since folks can work remotely, which is really great, but in the rural space, we now have 10% of our workforce that makes $200,000 on average or more, and the rest of the workforce that lives and works locally makes $54,000 per family, um, and 10% of those folks make live on or below the poverty line. So we have this like intense wealth disparity that has kind of taken this rural space by storm. And I looked at those numbers and it suddenly clicked to me. It's like, okay, what are the priorities for these two groups of people to be seen and work together? What it told us was that people working here remotely, um, their biggest concern for the next five years was how we were gonna combat climate change and wildland fires. And people making $54,000 per family a year were mostly concerned about um, sustainable housing. And so as an organization, we look at that and we think we have two obligations here. We have an obligation to teach people who have the privilege of choice what a refuse culture looks like and how through repair and reuse, they can help facilitate um, working towards the changing climate and really feel like they're doing something um, because we know that that's important to them. And on the other side, the people who are really struggling just to put basic needs together, we can teach them how they can save money in their family by repairing the things that are broken so they don't have to replace them, they don't have to get rid of them, they can easily be repaired. So bringing those two dynamics together has been hugely powerful to be seen and to work together on a common good for the community. Um, we work and partner with our local food bank. Um, they help uh, host our repair events. So we're directly talking to people who need the service the most while also bringing people together who need to be seen and have that hold space in the community. So, the way that repair brings people together to build community is just cannot be overstated. Um, repair events do an amazing thing by creating a community within a community. And many people who run repair events know the fixer community. It is so powerful. Um, a lot of our fixers here in the Meta Valley are elders. They're people who have retired from various backgrounds who come together and this could be the only event every month where they see these people and they talk to each other and they share repair. Um, and I've sat in on multiple focus groups um, talking to fixers because they're our most important volunteers. They power the program. And for them, the number one thing is that they get to spend time with their friends talking about stuff that matters to them. And so it really creates space for elders to fight social isolation. Um, and I, I mean, I can't tell you enough how you all know who run repair events. Like the fixers are just an amazing group of people. Um, in the rural space, it is a very talked about subject about preserving like the rural way of life. And repair and reuse and share. These are all ways we dig into rural communities because that 
these are the concepts that rural communities were founded on. When people were just stewarding land, they had very limited resources and they were shared with each other and they repaired together and they took care of each other. Um, and so I talk a lot in my community about how we're preserving the rural lifestyle and we're helping fight climate change at the same time through these programs. And it has been incredibly, incredibly rewarding. All right, I'm gonna go on to the next slide here. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some kind of what we've started to do in our reuse side of what we're doing. Um, because we're a nonprofit, we're always looking to our community to tell us what services the community needs and how we can work with our partners to help our community be healthier, um, be more active. And the local school district and the preschool here did a survey. And what they found was working families had zero options for affordable care during summertime. And they wanted the care to be quantifiable, so more than just a couple of half days. And they wanted it to be a safe space where kids could have fun and learn something. And so we created the Remake Summer Camp. Um, it's a three week long program in the summer. We work it Monday through Friday. And we partnered with the local school district to offer the program free to any Meta Valley school district child. And then any child that wasn't from the school district, it was only $75 a week. And it was crazy. Our registration filled up in three days. Um, we had a, a hundred kids on the waiting list. Um, and for us, it was like, we figured this out. Here we get this great opportunity to teach a new generation of eco leaders. Um, and we're really serving a purpose for our community through these ideas of reuse, of resourcefulness, of resilience through repair. Um, we had a whole day where we had fixers come and teach kids how to stitch things. Um, we have a vision for the future where we'll have like misfit toy week where kids can bring their broken toys and then they can repair them, make them into new toys. Um, it's just been really rewarding and really it, it the community remembers like the kids walking in the parade with trash and outfits on. Um, it was, it's been really wonderful and beautiful to see. So another innovation is that we are always having conversations at Meta Recycles on how we create access for anybody in the community. Um, so we recently transitioned a take it or leave it program into a material reuse and building reclamation material program called the Remake Center. And through the food bank and the social service provider locally, we offer a voucher. So anybody can come and use the program anytime that it's open. And we have seen it become hugely successful. People build um, chicken coops and greenhouses and tiny homes, um, all from diverted building materials. As I'm sure many people here know that building and demolition, construction demolition is just a huge offender in the um, landfill. In the Meta Valley, construction of new homes is the number one employer of people. So it is a huge, huge space for diversion. And um, we really hope that in the future, we can figure out how to make this program bigger and reach more people. So that's where we come to innovations for the future <laughs> um, in the rural space. So we uh, have a MERC that we rent from the county of Okanagan. And we have a couple of little pilot programs that we want to grow. And so right now we're looking at a zero waste community center where we can have a repair workspace, a expanded share library, um, DIY classes, um, workshops on how to make, you know, shampoo and avoid plastic from the very beginning. So we have, we really have this vision of all these programs expanded under one roof that's open and accessible to anybody in the community. Um, and we want it to be kind of like a main street presence because we get a lot of tourists here and we really feel like 
our outreach and being on Main Street and having programs that are part of our everyday life and culture are going to help mold the future of how we live in this space. Um, so yeah, we, we don't have a name. I put on here Remake Commons because that gets thrown around occasionally. Um, but it's in the very early, early stages. Um, so we're hoping to do some feasibility and move that project forward for the future, um, creating a circular rural community. Um, so this next slide I wanna talk about is cha a challenge. Um, in the rural space, we have tons and tons of challenges, just like any other sector, any other place. Um, we have governmental challenges. We have people over politics, the isolated nature of our community. All of these things we're working on at a very granular level to move things forward. But the one thing that happens that I feel like is a really huge challenge to talk about in this space is ecological grief. Um, the Metau Valley is a frontline climate community. Uh, in 2014, we had the largest wildland fire in Washington State's history. The very next year, we had the Okanagan Complex fire, which outpaced the Carlton Complex fire. And every single year since then, we have either had a significant um, fire event or a significant smoke event. Our friends and neighbors have lost houses and livelihoods. We've lost our favorite place to sit by the river. We've lost the ability to breathe fresh air. And this, it can be crippling for a community, for individuals, for people working in this space. Um, it makes it really hard to think about how you can do anything against the enormity of the problems that we're facing. Um, and I worked with some Western Washington University interns this summer, and they really brought this topic out kind of from the shadows. And I really have spent a lot of time thinking about this because in the moment, we're all, um, you know, build a resilient community, work together, we pull our bootstraps up. But it does take time and energy and thinking to get people back into the mode of, you know, keeping it going. And, you know, there are, are tons of great ideas out there. There are lots of really engaged people working very hard. There are plans. There are smart people working in legislation to fight the enormity of our climate problem. And I just want to leave everybody with the knowledge that I constantly come back to. And that is that we are the action step. Everything we do is the action step to the plans, to the policies, every repair, every reused item, every moment of connection, of sharing, of community building, we are the action step. And so that always helps me and work my staff to like, you know, we just, we keep going. And it's important to highlight how hard it is, but it's also important to say like, Every tiny thing is important and it builds a culture for tomorrow. So that is it. I don't know if I have any time for questions. Yeah, you wrapped up quick. <laughs> I think we have like 10 minutes left. Oh, but, um, there was a question about inventory needed before you open the reuse store. What phase are you at with that? I guess if you want to give a little more. Yeah, so with the Remake Center, we do a big drive every spring because people do like their yard and farm cleanups. Um, so we try to do uh, like for a two week period before we kick it off for the season because right now the program lives outside in a tent and we have like four feet of snow. <laughs> so the program closes in the winter and then opens again in the summertime. So we just do a big drive. But I mean, I'm continually surprised by the amount of stuff that people bring to us. More questions popping up here. Um, can I ask if your position is paid? Uh, what's your staff size and how many volunteers or do you, you utilize paid staff? Maybe a little more details on that. Yeah, so I am a paid staff. We have six um, employees at Mental Recycles. We have three employees specifically that work to run the material reclamation facility. Um, so we have a full-time 
recycling operations manager in a another full-time operations person and an operations assistant in the warehouse. Um, and then I have a communications and marketing person. Um, she also helps with fundraising. And then we have a new position that we're developing, which is all of our circular economy and education programs manager. That's awesome. Growing, ever growing, it's a good thing. Um, I did, uh, at least I think, I hope I said that right, had a, a good point that to acknowledge the, the grief of the loss that happens in um, the fire season. And as one of those troublemaking tourists that likes to come out and visit you guys, um, it does make you know a huge impact when you, you go across that line and see these fields that are vastly devastated. So a picture is worth a thousand words. And you had a great picture and there's many more, I'm sure. There are so many pictures that I think it's like, you know, in the rural space, when you're a frontline climate community, the people who are disenfranchised first are the people who are living on the fringes. And so their entire world is destroyed. Everything that they've ever worked for, it could be like third generation family property that isn't insured anymore. Um, and it is a really intense. Um, I feel really lucky to be in this community where we have tons of resources available and lots of outreach for people, but it is hard. I mean, it's also hard um, on my operations staff and we get like a 10,000 pound delivery of commingle recycling. I mean, it is an intense heap of recycling uh, and it's hard work. Um, and I just go out there and I remind them, this could all have been in the landfill. You know, <laughs> so it's like trying to bring levity to the work that we do is just so important. Yeah, and there's, I used to say like, uh, if it was easy, it would have been done before. So you're doing something that's never been done before. That's definitely something to acknowledge. Uh, Dawn had a question about effective methods for recruiting volunteers in a rural, rural location. So we have a lot of early retirees who've moved to the Metal Valley who have time and energy to dedicate to our programs. I have volunteers who've been working bailing commodities for over 20 years. Um, getting our community engaged is, we are really, really lucky. I've never worked at a nonprofit that had this engaged group of volunteers who will just show up um, and I acknowledge how unusual that is and how lucky we are but it is the nature of the culture of our place and it does have a lot of to, to do with um, the action step part of what I was talking about people really like to feel like they're doing something that is affecting change in some way and by the nature of circular programs um, repair, you are doing something, you're physically putting your hands on something and making a difference. And that aspect has really like attracted a lot of volunteers to our programs. A couple more questions too about um, the disenfranchised and practically, you know, making that happen, how you approach that. And I don't want to say you already kind of said the answer, but I think it's that connection, right? You know, it's those uh you have a sort of maximum um equalizers when you live rurally yeah i think there's also so the meta valley is very unique and i'm sure that it is not unlike other destination rural locations that are by national parks um we have a lot of people with a, a like a profound financial capacity and then, and we also hide our poverty. So I know people that have lived here for years and until they volunteered like at the, as an EMT, they had no idea at the level of poverty that was in our, you know, community. And so we've done a lot of work trying to network with our local food bank and our local um, social service provider. So we can pointed and in very conscientious way, create um, relationships with people. So I have a 
staff person that delivers um, eco bags and the little vouchers that I showed at the food bank, one food pickup a month. So we have a staff person. Um, we do it in partnership with uh, Confluence Health, which is a healthcare provider in the region. Um, Cause it's all about, you know, it's, it's people's public health. Um, what we're talking about, there is in some cases because you opt into trash and recycling in the rural sector. Um, there are people who cannot afford to get rid of their trash. And so it accumulates, which can be a public health issue for them personally. So we understand the sensitivity of these topics and we try to create trust relationships within the community so we can help facilitate the, you know, getting their needs met. Really connecting there. Um, there was one more question about the reuse facility and what the funding model was, if it was free or what your vision is for that. So how we run it is because we're a nonprofit, we offer people in-kind donations to drop off anything that they want. Um, we have specific rules about what we can take, um, primarily because when it was a take it or leave it model, it really became like, a, I don't want to go to the trash. I just want to leave it here with you because it feels better. Um, but in reality, it's just trash. It needs to be taken care of. Um, so we have a very strict set of rules on what we'll take because we want to make sure that they're usable items that the community needs. Um, and then we resell them back to the community at a very low price. Like our doors are start at $5 and so do our windows. And then in the tent itself, we have a whole freebie section. So they're like nails and um, small tools and stuff like that, that we get a lot of. So people can come in and take anything out of the freebie section that they want. Um, but you know, the reality I tell my stuff all the time. Um, if somebody is in need of a thing so badly, um, you know, we can just give it to them. Uh, it, the program is set up to become financially stable over time through the resale of the items. But as a nonprofit, we really want to instill the culture. So if somebody needs it that bad, my staff always know that they can just give it away. That's awesome. I think we're at time. So yay, good job. <laughs>